is it, yeah, I'm sorry. What I said was, um, could you put your pencils, paper, computers away so you can be here? The trouble with us all as architects is architecture is about being here. And uh, taking notes ain't going to help. And it will be on YouTube, I've been told, within a half an hour. Um, I also would like all computers closed. So I, I watch carefully. Um, <clears throat> maybe this is a good thing, but uh, because of the uh, world of uh, unsettled world of uh, academic sports, uh, this will be my next to last visit at Syracuse. Um, and so I will uh, fondly remember the, the times I've been here. I think this is my fifth or sixth, uh, I'm not certain, but uh, uh, I was here, actually I gave the, what, the Werner Seligman lecture, the first Werner Seligman lecture. Uh, many of you probably don't remember Werner Seligman, but uh, you look too young to remember him, but uh, he was in my class at Cornell, and um, we actually didn't like each other. Uh, we became friends later. Uh, he, Werner was a, f a fantastic architect, and I was a fantastic college kid. Uh, and that was the problem. Uh, uh, the Army quickly turned me away from being a fantastic Army, I mean, fantastic college kid. So uh, there was a time when I was like you all that I he would either have gone to sleep in this lecture or not been here. Uh, Werner would have been in the front row. So um, anyway, thank you, Mark, again for having me. I know you don't know why I'm here, in other words, but uh, uh, I've recommended a good book for you. Uh, uh, and uh, I get a commission on all the copies. So anyway. Um, I'm going to, uh, I've uh, talked around the subject project and practice. Um, I spoke with Mark Wigley uh, about it. Um, I've introduced the idea to my students, but I've done a lot more work on it uh, since I did that. And um, I um, want to try out for about 20 minutes or so, uh, this idea. And then I'm going to show two buildings, uh, one of which is about to begin in, in Milano, and the other was just finished uh, in Santiago de Compostela in Spain. Uh, one, a housing project, uh, which I've never just got the slides made yesterday. I, I guess they're not slides anymore. CD, and the other is uh, the museum building in Santiago, which is about to open, which has also never been uh, f seen, and so I'm going to show those two buildings. So if you get bored with the thing, the, the talking, uh, there'll be some interesting pictures, hopefully, uh, to see. Um, I will say that... Um, I'm not certain uh, what I do. Uh, I like to think that I have a project, but I'm not sure that I practice uh, my project. Uh, but I will first tell you that uh, my quick definition uh, of project versus practice, and I say it this way, as if you have a project or if one has a project it is the architect who defines the world around him, her. And if you have a practice, it is the world that defines you. And I think both are uh, viable ways to think the world. Some of you will not be interested in defining the world. Uh, others of you will not be interested in having the world define you. Uh, 
Uh, it depends on not your talent or your intelligence. I think it depends on how you see yourself in your world and why you're doing it. If you're here uh, to save the world, I'm not sure that's a project. Um, if you are interested in uh, uh, sustainability, I'm sure that's a project. In fact, I know that sustainability uh, is not a project. Um, a project involves the discipline of architecture in some way. That is, the discipline being able to define the world as we see it and being able to be a critical resonance uh, on that definition. That is, any project is always a critique of the status quo uh, and of the discipline, that is. So therefore, a project is always in some way political, ideological, uh, intellectual, etc. I will give you a few examples of what I think a project is and what I think a practice is. For example, I think that the architect Borromini had a project. The architect Bernini had a practice. Now, Bor Bernini, who had a practice, was in fact the most powerful architect in the world at his in his moment in time. And uh, Borromini had just a few buildings to do. In fact, Borromini, who had a project, was so upset by Bernini that he ended up killing himself. Uh, so obviously, a project may not necessarily be a good thing uh, to have. Uh, <clears throat> it certainly does not give you power in the sense that Bernini had power, or let's say someone like Philip Johnson had power. The second most powerful architect that known in history, Philip Johnson, had a practice. He never had a project. To get closer to home, though, uh, maybe this would be closer to home, I would argue that two architects of the generation just before me, uh, Aldo Rossi, had a project, James Sterling had a practice. Uh, Robert Venturi has a project. Um, Skidmore, Owings and Merrill, IMP, KPF have practices. So there's a choice to be made between project and practice. I don't give them a weight, uh, but I will say honestly that our histories of architecture, the ones that we all study, the people that we go and see, for the most part, the people that we know had a project, and history records those architects that have a project. And I believe, in fact, that most of the architects that have a project um, are in were interested in recording, if it was not to record how... Uh, they defined society at the time, certainly to record in history how they defined uh, society at the time. So I think that um, we could look at, for example, Le Corbusier, and there were a lot of French architects, Malais Stevens, André Lussard, and others who were doing little white houses at the same time as Le Corbusier. So it's not the question of the little white houses. It's the question of the attitude toward those houses that was manifest in Le Corbusier's writings and in his thinking, which uh, one cannot say about Lorsa and Malais de Vence. I want to go further and say that uh, there have been what I consider to be six projects in the history of Western architecture. And I, I do this, uh, this typology, let's say, so that you can understand the difference between what it means to be a practitioner and what it means to 
define the world through the di discipline of your work. I think the first project uh, in architecture was Vitruvius's 10 books. That is the kind of a touchstone from which all other treatises uh, that followed 15 centuries later uh, were written. And in fact, Vitruvius was the first one to, in a way, be consciously uh, involved in defining what the di discipline was. He was codifying certain things, in particular the orders, uh, rigid adherence to proportion, uh, and the three main orders, the Doric, Ionic, and Corinthian. Um, while Vitruvius, who operated in the first century, um, was Roman, his ideas of architecture were Greek. And so that the really first project was uh, the bringing into the Roman world of the first century uh, a Greek idea of architecture. And I believe that that notion between that dialogue between Greek architecture and Roman architecture exists today, uh, that still exists, that uh, in a sense, Mies van der Rohe was a Greek, uh, Le, Corbusier, Le Corbusier was a Roman. That is, one dealt with the, fr the frontal relationship of the subject to the object, that is, the human subject in front of the object. The other dealt with the human subject at a 45-degree angle. That is, the corner was more important to the Greeks than it was to the Romans, more important to Mies than it was to Le Corbusier. Um, <clears throat> also, uh, Vitruvius was the first person that was concerned not only with proportion, with the rules of architecture, in other words, a certain grammar, but he was also interested in the idea of the siting of a building, the relationship of a building to its site, which later becomes in the 20th century the idea of genius loci. The second project, I would argue, is, uh, comes about in the Renaissance, comes about in the, in the dawning in the 15th and 16th century, but in the middle of the 15th century with uh, Leone Battista Alberti. And Alberti also, in the style of uh, Vitruvius, wrote a book, uh, called De Re uh, Edificatoria, uh, uh, in Latin, on architecture. And Alberti's was a critique of Vitruvius. And uh, what he critiqued were two things. One, that we cannot adhere to rules of proportion uh, as rigidly as Vitruvius would have liked. Uh, that we must, in fact, uh, when we look at the actual things that the Greeks built, there were no really rigid following of the orders. And second, he introduced the fact that there were two other orders, the Tuscan order, which came before the Doric order, and the composite order, which was a composite of the Ionic and the Corinthian. And so uh, not only did he critique uh, Vitruvius's idea of proportion and the orders, but he critiqued uh, the absence of these two other orders. The second thing that he did was to say that uh, when Vitruvius said commodity, firmness, and delight, firmitas, uh, he didn't mean that buildings should stand up. He meant that they should look like they stand up. And so Alberti introduced the idea of representation, that a building was not only the thing itself, but it was also the sign of the thing, not necessarily a sign that related outward to some idea, some meaningful notion, but inward. And 
the whole notion, he said, that a column is, uh, must have a certain proportion, not because of its beauty necessarily, but because of its use, that it has to look like it stands up for the uh, dimension that is necessary. Alberti also uh, started uh, several other uh, ideas which we are still thinking about today uh, when he said a small uh, city is like a large house and a large house is like a small city, which meant that the small parts of things related in some way to a larger constellation of things. Uh, the idea uh, of consinitas, uh, of a part-to-whole relationship. Um, and the, the next thing was, an, in addition to the idea of a sign, uh, was a notion of antiquarianism. In other words, the first time one could borrow from history uh, to bring things from uh, the first century uh, to uh, the present. And of course, uh, we see that borrowing from history in architects that followed after Alberti a hundred years later in Palladio and others uh, in the uh, villas uh, of the 16th century. So I would argue that Alberti uh, taking a critique of Vitruvius produced an, a new, I new idea of what the discipline of architecture was that influenced a, an, a, a group of architects that were to follow in the uh, 16th century. The thing that's important in Alberti, and it's still with us today, is the idea of representation, history, uh, and the sign. That is the relationship of the sign and the signified. The minute you have these things, you have what is, what, what is called a metaphysical project. I mean, things that are beyond the physical presence of architecture. And architecture is often thought by contemporary philosophers as the locus of the metaphysics of presence. And one of the ideas that Alberti uh, placed was this metaphysical project. And he took the metaphysical project from something that can be called a transcendental metaphysic, that is, from something mediated by a godlike figure to an imminent, I-M-M-A-N-E-N-T, that is, an internal metaphysic. And, of course, while this was a revolutionary idea in the 16th, 15th century, and again in the 16th century, Today, that metaphysic is the source of much questioning about people who are interested in the project of architecture. The third project of architecture, I would argue, uh, comes about in the 17th century. That is, I'm leaving out Borromini, Bernini, Rinaldi, P Palladio, many of my favorite architects who I do not believe had a critical project. They had projects, and probably I'm distinguishing when I say there are six projects. I should have said six meta-projects because Palladio had a project, Bor uh, Brunelleschi had a project, Borromini had a project, but these were merely uh, subsets of these six meta projects. The third meta project um, is Claude Perrault, uh, <clears throat> the French architect who worked on the Louvre, um, and he produced in 1673 a book called The Ordonnance, or The Ordering of Architecture, a, a new idea of what order should be, and <clears throat> uh, what he said was that there are no Greek ideals, by the way, uh, 
uh, that uh, there's got to be some alternative to that that deals with the present. And he introduced the idea, um, even though the term had not been founded until the uh, 18th, uh, late 18th century, the introduction of the term zeitgeist, that is, spirit of the age. And Perrault was the first person that said, we must be interested in aesthetic progress. That is, our work must deal with the spirit of the day. That is, we are dealing with new functions, uh, and of course this would be the case uh, a century later with the French Revolution. He was, was a critique of, of the uh, stringency uh, and, and narrowness of Vitruvius and uh, opened up a whole genre of possible uh, alternatives. In the same spirit, uh, there was uh, Julien David Loire, and uh, who was very important uh, in the uh, 18th century, who comes out of uh, the meta project of Perrault. And uh, of course, Loire uh, is important uh, in the history because in 1780, just after the French Revolution, Loire became the first uh, professor in the Academy of France, a uh, professor of theory. Uh, before that, theory uh, had not been recognized. And of course, that comes out of Loire's book, um, where it's divided into two, a project of history and a project of theory. So the first time these two projects were placed side by side, 1780 becomes the first time that there is a recognition of this project in the Academy of France. So that all, the, the Loire work, comes out of uh, Claude Perrault in 1673, 1780. A century later, uh, he becomes a professor of theory. For me, the fourth meta project is the uh, project of Piranesi. And uh, the notion of arbitrary invention, which comes right out of the possibilities articulated by Claude Perrault in the Ordonnance. If it hadn't been for Perrault, we wouldn't have had Piranesi. And of course, Piranesi only builds uh, one building uh, in Rome on the Aventine Hill, but he does leave us with uh, many interesting works, particularly the Campo Marzio, which is a, a wonderful invention of an idea of the urban. And what you have in the Campo Marzio, which is unique uh, in the history of architecture up until that moment, and perhaps even after, is the bringing together of, in a map, uh, of a place uh, two different or three different times. And so we have a, the time of the Roman first century, which is the basis of the Piranesi map. We have the time of the uh, 18th century when Piranesi drew this map. And so some buildings that had been extant in the uh, first century were not extant in the 18th century. Some buildings that had been in the first century were moved to other sites. And some buildings which had existed in the first century were either larger or smaller uh, than they really were. So we change not only uh, the site, we change the time, we change the scale. And all of this is both historically accurate and invention of history. And so uh, when we're looking at the Piranesi, we see something quite extraordinary about a map. Very different than, let's say, uh, the Noli map of Rome, which is the sort of icon of postmodernism, uh, <coughs> and uh, in many respects, the icon of 
uh, of the School of Architecture uh, down the road in Ithaca. Um, Piranesi set forth the possibility of thinking site in a different way that is not site-specific, thinking about scale in a different way, thinking about time in a different way. So site, scale, and time uh, became very important. The last thing that's important about Piranesi's uh, meta project is the bringing together of text and image. Uh, that um, it's very important to realize that without the text that Piranesi wrote, uh, and there were many more of them than, in fact, uh, the buildings that he did, since he only did one, uh, the text becomes important to the Piranesian project. For me, the fifth project, uh, which I think is important for us today, uh, comes about uh, in, the, in the 19th century, in, uh, and the date being 1818, when theory and history uh, become one. In other words, rather than be separated in a professor of theory and a professor of history, in 1818, uh, Catomer de Cancy, J.N.L. Durand, and others of the French Academy bring theory and history uh, together in the Academy. Uh, and that is a, a, an enormous uh, change where uh, by they were separated before, they were recognized before, but they finally come together in one project. Uh, I can't link that to one particular architect, but to me, uh, it's certainly important in uh, our study of uh, architecture today. Um, the, 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 the argument, by the way, one of the arguments that I forgot in the uh, Piranesi argument the, the dialogue that he has with Leroy and others is the idea of invention versus imitation. Uh, imitation being uh, a, a, a la grec, uh, and invention being something that uh, comes out of uh, the definition of the world. So you could argue invention uh, is the project uh, of the architects of project and imitation is the uh, uh, condition of the architects of practice. The last project, and I think it's defined uh, by Le Corbusier uh, in 1914, um, is the project of autonomy. Uh, and this is a project where architecture uh, for the first time is not necessarily relying on uh, the historical precedents, not relying on uh, the political and social uh, upheavals of the French Revolution, let's say, but an architecture that comes out of its own uh, discipline entirely. And, of course, uh, Le Corbusier's um, canonical domino project uh, of 1914, I think, is the symbol of, of this uh, condition, uh, because while it can be read as a symbol of modern technology, of mass production, of all kinds of, uh, of, of mass housing, uh, it also can be read as a discourse of autonomy. Uh, and I think that uh, this is from 1914 to uh, where we are today, uh, you know, 100 years practically, um, is under the, whether it's modernism, postmodernism, deconstructionism, whatever, uh, they all deal with the project of uh, autonomy. Why am I giving this lecture here? Uh, well, first of all, I want to understand it for myself, and every time I get it, give it, I have to read more, think more, etc. It becomes more defined, uh, because to me, 
Um, I would like to try and teach project. I think that uh, school is the place to understand project. Practice, you can go to Skidmore, you can go to KPF, you can go to IMP, any of those places to learn how to practice. But you can't learn the discipline in those offices. And so the only place to understand the idea of project, I think, is in school. That doesn't mean that the teachers have to have a project. That means they have to understand what it means to uh, have an idea about architecture that is transformational and critical. And so I give this lecture here because I think even though many of you, 75, 80, 90 percent of you, will become practitioners, uh, there may be some in this audience who will find the need to make a project. I would argue that the world of architecture today is about ready for a critical project. It's been a hundred years uh, since we've had a critical meta project. So it's a very interesting moment in time. Surely Venturi had a pro has a project. Kulhas has a project. <coughs> Zaha Hadid has a project. Um, Alvaro Siza has a project. There are lots of architects maybe in the world that have a project. Uh, but none of them, I think, have a meta project. I think REM's project aspires to being a meta project, and maybe it's too early uh, to think that idea. But um, there is no way to be able to understand the idea of project and how architecture moves forward uh, without, I think, the concept of project. So that's why I put it on uh, the table today. Okay. Now, I'm going to show you uh, two works of ours that I have uh, never shown before because I hadn't seen them in pictures before. One, a, a housing project in Milan, um, and two, a new museum that's part of the complex of six buildings in Santiago de Compostela uh, that has uh, just been finished. The housing project in Milan uh, is just about to begin. Now, why I show both is because I believe that a housing project can rarely be anything more than practice. Uh, uh, you know, it's not possible to reinvent the wheel. My clients wanted uh, upper middle class accommodation for uh, upper middle class Italian bourgeoisie. Uh, and they didn't want a, a radical project. Now, when somebody's asking you to do, uh, let's say, an 80 million euro project, and you say, well, I only do projects, uh, I don't practice, uh, I don't think you say that. I think you say, oh, thank God somebody's giving me a project that pays, right? Uh, and so housing projects, for the most part, are boring. All right. Uh, because there ain't anything new uh, about them. Uh, it doesn't take much to put a bathroom next to a bedroom. Uh, I wouldn't think, uh, especially when there's so many, you need so many square feet for a bedroom, so many for a bathroom, so much light to come in, uh, etc. Uh, the worst kind of project, let's say. Uh, so I'm going to show you that. Um, I can say it's a project, but it ain't. Uh, it's a practice. Uh, and then I'm going to show you a museum project, which, uh, in a sense, uh, has no program uh, and was defined by what I consider to be disciplinary ideas, uh, which may have little to do with a, a museum. In fact, uh, Jeff Kipnis, uh, the, the critic from Ohio State, uh, went over to see this project uh, with the idea of perhaps doing an exhibition there. And he said, uh, I wouldn't even dare to do an exhibition in this place. Uh, 
because it would be very uh, difficult. Um, he said uh, in a positive sense about the project that it was one of the first buildings that he had seen that he would call having a critical affect. Uh, now, don't ask me what a critical affect is. It's a quote from Jeffrey Kipnis. I, I only use it because I'm not sure uh, what it means or if, in fact, what we have done is a project. So I'm going to show you two buildings. I think the opportunities uh, when you are in practice, uh, as I am, to do a project to or at least execute something that uh, can be called a project are very rare. Uh, we're just starting a 500,000 square foot shopping mall outside of Naples. It ain't a project, right? But it's a big commission, right? And allows me to come up and smile uh, every two years uh, and, and uh, uh, stay in the practice of architecture. Manfredo Tafuri, and I close before I show this, said to me, uh, you know, Peter, I would not have been interested in your architectural project if you hadn't practiced architecture. And it was a very telling remark for me because at one point in my life, I didn't think it was necessary to practice architecture. So I don't think that you can arrive at a project uh, whole. I think you have to go through the possibility of practice uh, to arrive at project. But also, you have to go through uh, the school to understand what that difference might be, so that when you're confronted with the possibility of project, you would seize that notion. So with that in mind, and I think uh, it was really important for me that the critical theoretical historian Manfredo Tafuri recognized my work, uh, very important for me. Uh, but it was also important that he taught me that lesson, that without practicing, he would never have been interested in my project. With that, I'm going to, uh, we're going to dim the lights and we're going to look at some pictures. Uh, and as I said, these are the 